We're going to be in the uh, 13th chapter of the book of Matthew. We took a short break from the book of Revelation because we finished chapters 4 and 5, and you will remember the heavenly worship service. And in January, we're going to start to look at chapters 6 through 19 in the book of Revelation, the things which will happen. It's describing the time um, future from us, from our perspective here, and we're going to see what's going to happen, how Christ is going to reclaim creation. But for now, we decided to take a short break to focus on the kingdom of God, something that Christ came to establish in, in his first coming, he offered to his own people. And you will remember the Gospel of John says that his own people received him not, but to those who received him he gave the powers to become children of God. Because of the fact that the Jews or national Israel rejected Christ, he offered the kingdom to Gentiles. And we've been looking at the mystery form of the kingdom of God, which is the period from the first coming of Christ all the way to the second coming of Christ. Um, he spoke about those truths in parable form, which we concluded last week is a very effective tool, a literary device, to both conceal and reveal at the same time. Now, why would Jesus conceal truth and reveal at the same time? Well, he explains it in Matthew 13, verses 10 through 11. He says this, um, The disciple has asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered to them and said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has, been, it has not been granted. Which means that for us, uh, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven because we eavesdrop on the explanation that Jesus gives about the first parable, the parable of the sower. It's the very first parable recorded in the Gospels in the first of seven about the kingdom of God in this very chapter here. And we know that this is talking about the time when the king is temporarily and physically absent. We know he's coming back to be physically present. So the mystery form of the kingdom of heaven will merge into the millennial form of the kingdom of heaven when Jesus comes back, and that all becomes the new heaven and the new earth. But in the meantime, uh, we have a lot to learn. There's, there's a lot of things for us to know. Th that's what he means by mysteries of the kingdom. It doesn't mean it's a riddle. It doesn't mean it's an enigma. It means it's something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but now is fully revealed for us to understand. So we are a part of a very blessed generation because we have the full revelation of God here. We can understand uh, the mystery form of the kingdom of heaven. So we started last week talking, talking about that parable. We understood that there are four realities of the kingdom. Those realities were the announcers, the announcement, the antagonist, and the audience about the kingdom. And now we're going to look at four different responses to the king because that's what we celebrate in Christmas, is it not? The arrival of the king. The king is here. And that's why he announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is here. His people have rejected him. He died and rose again and went to heaven. The kingdom in mystery form continues here. And understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven for us will be very relevant because it will save us from a lot of frustration. Why? Because according to Jesus Christ here, not everybody responds the same way uh, to the king when he's offering himself. When the announcers of the kingdom, uh, meaning you and me today, offer to people, hey, the king is here, heaven is available, not everybody will embrace that message the way you did. And so understanding that truth will save us from a lot of frustration, from burnout, and from even fabricating man-focused ministries, fabricating responses uh, so that we can report large numbers, so that we can appear successful according to the world's standards. So let's, uh, let's understand what Christ means when he spoke the parable of the sword. We'll pick up here Matthew 13, verses uh, 8 through 23 he says this hear then the parable of the sower he's explaining that parable to the disciples when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart this is the one who's uh, on whom seed was sown beside the road the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy yet he has no firm root in himself but is only temporary and when affliction and persecution arises uh, because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. 
And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And church, that's how Jesus reveals the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to his disciples primarily and now to you and me. But now we're going to talk about the four different responses to the king that he explains very clearly here. And he illustrates those in four different types of soil. Did you notice that? Different types of soil correspond to the different responses that people will give to Jesus Christ when exposed to the gospel. But let's again um, situate ourselves contextually here. By the chapter uh, 12 of Matthew, the scribes and the Pharisees have uh, utterly rejected Christ. And uh, so much that they uh, started to attribute to him the works of the devil. They rejected his works and words, but they could not ignore his miracles. So their solution was, he's doing that by the power of Satan, by the power of Beelzebub. To which Christ explained to them in, uh, something that even Abraham Lincoln used one time as a quote, a house divided cannot uh, stand. Now, and Jesus warned about that kind of um, unbelief because this was a symptom of an unbelieving heart. And the problem was, Jesus says, I operate by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you ascribe uh, the works of the devil to me, that's a symptom of an unbelieving heart. And if that unbelief persists, there is no salvation. If that unbelief persists until death, it is impossible for you to be saved. Therefore, that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the unpardonable sin. And he continued explaining to them, uh, this truth because their unbelief turned into hostility by now and they demanded a sign they said if you're the messiah we need a sign and christ said i'm not going to give you a sign he's not going to cater to the sinful desires of people just look at my words and my works he says and he, obviously he didn't grant uh, their request they, he condemned their attitude see their reject or they, their denial of jesus christ turned into hostility that hostility turned into arrogance and they stood condemned and that is why he tells his disciples, to you it has been granted to understand, but to them it has not been granted. Why? Because their heart is already predisposed to reject me. So he gives them the parable of uh, the sower to them. And the disciples here not only were encouraged to know that <laughs> he's got this under control. Jesus Christ, even though people are rejecting the Messiah, he's got this under control. So much so that it was time for Christ to be ascended into heaven. They asked him, is it at this time? that you're going to uh, restore the kingdom? Are you going to crush the Romans now? Are we going to reign with you now? And he said, no. <laughs> Apparently you understood only half of it. You will be my witnesses. That's the reality of the kingdom. That's the mystery form of the kingdom. Now, and they needed to understand that not everybody would respond to the king the way they did. And church, same goes to us. We need to understand that not everybody will embrace Jesus Christ the way you did. Um, and no matter how convincing the proof was, Jesus was there before them, their very eyes. He was there performing miracles, validating the message. And yet they refused to believe. Even in our day, church, despite the fact that plenty of evidence can be presented for the resurrection of Christ, people still refuse to believe. And we understand that unbelief is not ignorance. It's rebellion against God and against Christ. Not because the message is hard to understand. It's easy to grasp. A five-year-old can explain the message of the gospel. I've seen it done before. The problem is not a lack of understanding, but a lack of belief, a refusal to acknowledge Jesus Christ. This man is not going to rule over my life. I refuse the kingdom of God. Why? Because I prefer my own way. People do this all the time. And it's our job to communicate to people that that is a flawed belief system. It's better to understand and believe that Jesus Christ is the king and he's going to establish his kingdom. He came the first time and he's coming back again. See, the people prior to the cross believe they were saved by grace through faith, believing in the coming Messiah. You and I believe in a returning Messiah. But Jesus spoke to them in the parable. Let's read the parable again so that uh, we're, we're, we're all clear on what he's talking about here. He's using an analogy. Remember, a parable means to throw alongside or to lay side by side so that you can see an, the analogy. Okay? A parable, again, is a non-fictitious uh, or non-fantasy story about day-to-day -day life. And, and they understood this very well. Jesus was a master at telling his stories and communicating truth in that way. So this is what he says in Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9. He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate them up. 
Others fell in the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprung up. They sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they um, were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded their crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And I, I love the way Jesus finishes this parable, saying, you know, this is for everybody. You need to understand this truth. Again, he gives the parable, and he gives the explanation. We just inverted it in our message today. We gave the explanation first. Now, the different soils, again, correspond to the different types of responses to the king. And one thing we need to understand about the mystery form of the kingdom of God is that both true believers and false believers grow together. True believers and false believers coexist in, during this form of the kingdom of God, the mystery kingdom. That is evident in another parable, the parable of the, the wheat and the tares. Jesus explains this very clear. And the tares will be burned, meaning they will be sent to hell because they have no true salvation. It's not real faith. It's not the real thing. But here's how he explains the first kind of response to the king. And according to verse 19, when people are exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, some of them will respond in total rejection. Total rejection. That's the first point here. And the reason for that is that the seed does not penetrate the soil is presumably the soil is hardened. It's not soft enough, so the seed bounces right back and becomes exposed to the birds. Now, uh, in the immediate context of this, he's talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes because they were rejecting Jesus Christ. See, in their minds, they're saying, we don't need you. We are okay with God. We are the religious elite, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. They are the ones who are outside of God's grace, not us. So why should we believe you? Why should we believe that you are the long-awaited Messiah? And friends, they were blinded by their sin. They were blinded by their perception of religiosity, their, their perceived self-righteousness, and not unlike our day. Many people will tell you, thank you, I will pass on your Jesus. The drug addict, yeah, that, he needs Jesus Christ. The prostitute, yeah, she needs Jesus Christ. Not me, I am a good person. I do good to people. I'm better than my neighbor. I pay my taxes on time. And they will reject the Jesus Christ. And friends, the only reason you and I have not rejected Christ when exposed to the gospel is because God did a supernatural work in our hearts. The Holy Spirit prepared the heart uh, in our hearts so that the seed can penetrate the soil. Otherwise, we would have been hardened the same way. I know I was. Now, what happens today is as in, in one end of the extreme of the uh, people will say, well, I, I don't need Jesus Christ. That, that's something that those people over there need. Now, on the other end here of the spectrum, people will say, I am beyond salvation. In fact, I've heard this uh, from uh, people before and I'm sharing the gospel to them and say, no, you don't understand. <laughs> if only you knew what I've done. God is unable to save me and it, both extremes are, are equally wrong and it's our opportunity to clarify to them, no, nobody is beyond the grace of God. Nobody is unsavable unless... Um, you continued in your unbelief, yes, there will be no salvation for you. But the problem is the devil is still in the agricultural business as well. He snatches away the seed, Jesus says. He is a farmer to only a bad one. And this is, Jesus clarifies this in Matthew 13, verse 25. In another parable, he says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while the men were sleeping, his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So the devil is the sower of confusion. The devil is in the business of providing a counterfeit gospel, providing a counterfeit system, which normally includes um, the, the idolatry of men, the idolatry of perceived autonomy, the idolatry of, um, of thinking that you can produce your own salvation. But remember, we are the sowers. We concluded that last week. We are the ones who carry the message. We are the ones broadcasting the seed, and it's our job to make sure that the seed is correct, that the message is the right message. Otherwise, we're doing the, jo the job that belongs to the devil, confusing people. Now, and we are, when we are sowing the seed of the gospel. We're not primarily inviting people to join the church. That's only secondary. We're not telling them to switch teams and become a Baptist from now on. That's not what we're talking about. That's all secondary. We're talking about them becoming saved. 
them uh, coming to the end of themselves and realizing that they need God's grace, that they can't produce their own salvation. And we tell them, be admitted into the kingdom of God. And the only way that's, that's possible is if you come to faith in Jesus Christ. You respond to him in faith. But we understand that when we are in this business, we will encounter resistance. People will resist the message. They have done it since the beginning. The, elig- the religious elite of Jesus' time were resisting the message, so much so that they became hostile to the king. Now, so what should we do when we encounter that level of resistance, when we're inviting people to, to be admitted into the kingdom of God, when we tell people, come to Jesus Christ, and they say, no, thank you, I'll pass on your Jesus. What, do, we, do we change the message? No, of course not. Do we water down the gospel so that it will be more appealing to people? No, 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 no. That would be the ultimate act of treason, changing the message that doesn't belong to us. We are not the originators of the message. We are not the originators of the seed. It's our job to reach down the bag and broadcast the seed. But we need to do it faithfully. So what do we do then when people reject? How should we deal with people whose hearts are hardened by their sins? We are compassionate. We pray for them. We, we pray that God will plow the soil in their hearts. We lament that people reject Christ. And we pray for God to soften their hearts for future encounters, for future opportunities to uh, sow the seed of the gospel. But rejection should never make us stop. You should never stop throwing the seeds of the gospel, sowing the seeds of the gospel because people will say no. Jesus Christ, that's, that says this is a regular thing. Every time you sow the seeds, people will say no because their hearts, because of the condition of their hearts. I want you to meet a man whose heart was so hardened by sin that he was a Pharisee. He was a persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus, you heard about him. In fact, he talks about his own testimony in Galatians 1. He says this, you, heard, you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. In other words, I was doing the work of the devil. I was collecting the seeds of the gospel. I was there doing, um, uh, doing what the devil wanted me to do. And he says, I, would, uh, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, meaning I was planting the wrong seed. I was planting the wheat. In fact, I was killing people who were receiving the gospel. But then comes one of my favorite expressions of the Bible. But when God, but when God, and he continues here, Paul of Tarsus then becomes Paul the apostle when he says, but when God, who has set me apart even from a mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Meaning he became a preacher of the gospel. He became a sower of the good seeds. And only God can do that, my friends. That's not something that's accomplished by human reason, by human philosophies, by human power. That is divine power here. And he says this, I became a preacher of the gospel. And I have good news for us this morning. God is in the same business. He's been doing this ever since and he continues to do it day by day. People become Christians, they receive Jesus Christ because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the problem for Satan is that the Holy Spirit is still in the business of converting people and he also, he's also is in the farming business. He prepares the hearts of people to receive the king. The devil may blind the eyes of people, but Jesus Christ gives sight to the blind. And that's what the hymn is all about. I was blind, but now I see. I was, uh, I was found, but now I am lost. And again, the only reason you and I embrace the gospel is because of the grace of God. Friends, because otherwise we were suppressors of the truth. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 1. We knew the truth instinctively. Every unbeliever knows the truth. Every unbeliever knows that there is a God. They just decide to ignore him. And they think that if they do this long enough, you'll leave him alone. And it's our job to tell them, no, there's coming a day when God is going to require of you. There's coming a day where you're going to have to face the God you've ignored your whole life. And that's tragic. If you keep rejecting Him, there is no salvation for you. The good news is it doesn't have to be this way if you would just come to Him in, in faith and receive Him. But people continue to suppress the truth in unrighteousness, Paul says, and they will continue to do that until the mystery form of the kingdom becomes the millennial uh, form of the kingdom. So that's the first kind of response total rejection here um, symbolized by the the hardened soil 
Well, here's the second type of response according to verses 20 to 21 in, cha- in Matthew uh, 13 here. Temporary selection. We've seen people who respond to the gospel in total rejection, but there will be also people who respond to him in temporary selection. And what I mean by that is exactly what Jesus Christ explains here. In the second analogy of the ground here, the ground is soft enough for the seed to penetrate. There's no problem there. The problem is when the seed starts to want to grow, it encounters uh, rocks in the ground, and there is no room for the root to develop. So as a result, the root goes up in search for water. And when it goes up, it is met with the heating, with the scorching heat of the sun. And Jesus uses uh, the analogy here, heat, the heat of affliction and persecution. You see, the sower gets the initial impression that this is a fruitful crop. It deceives him. He, he, he gets the impression of immediate result. He gets excited. He might even be tempted to spend more time in that particular crop because of the apparent uh, fruitfulness. But it, it's only a matter of time before the whole thing falls apart. And Jesus says, well, the test is persecution and affliction. And Jesus then clarifies to us that some people, yes, will have an initial response, positive response to the gospel. They will have, they'll give all the impressions that, that their salvation is real, but their enthusiasm only lasts until the first trial, until the first um, uh, example of the heat from the sun here. And here's uh, what we learned from this. Here's a, a good lesson for us here. The heat of the sun, persecution and, and, and an affliction here, is, is common for everybody. This is part of the maturity process for you and me. Have you considered that? Well, you say, Pastor, I'm, I'm experiencing that right now. I'm going through persecution. I'm going through affliction. Friend, that's a natural process of your growth. It's meant to test your faith to see if you have the real thing or not. Consider that a blessing. Consider that a blessing from God. That's how it's supposed to be in the mystery form of the kingdom. There will be one day where, when persecution will be no more. But until then, we're supposed to endure. And the only reason you're going to endure, my friend, is if your faith is rooted in the word of God. Otherwise, it's not the real thing. Otherwise, it's not going to last the first affliction, the first trial. Unbelievers have no reason to persevere. They have no, no strength to do it. And why be criticized? Why go through persecution for Christ's name's sake if you can only say, well, it was only a temporary thing. I grew out of a phase. I, I only needed Jesus for that one period of my life. You see, now that things are good, I, I don't need him anymore, so I'm going to dispose of him. That's counterfeit faith. And that, that's the kind of people Jesus um, uh, is explaining here. These are the folks who select the less confrontational parts of the gospel. And they'll embrace this or that, that it fits their, their needs at the moment, at the time, but they reject uh, the, the, the whole package because the gospel always confronts people. It will always confront human reason. It will always confront human religiosity. So Jesus Christ is very clear here. See, these folks, uh, they, they, they keep showing up sporadically, they're here and there. They show up when, whenever there's a favorite preacher preaching, whenever there's a preferred style of worship or a particular cause or a friend or the possibility of meeting someone. But then when, when, when persecution starts, it becomes very clear that what they have is counterfeit faith. Unless you are rooted in the Word of God, you don't have the real thing, I'm afraid. And people cater to that. <laughs> Church leaders will know that and they will cater to that desire. They will cater to people's desire for temporary selection of the gospel here. So they preach a false gospel and people embrace that. Who doesn't want a, a Jesus who's a genie in a bottle? Who doesn't want a, a Jesus who will grant you three wishes that has nothing else to do but to, to, to serve you 24-7? Who doesn't like that message? That is very fleshly. That is very carnal. It's not the real thing. And Jesus Christ is very clear about that. So if Jesus Christ is not enough to get you through the, through the biggest hurdle of your life, which is to get to heaven, you, you need a Savior to get to heaven. If Jesus Christ is not, a, not enough for that, you do not have the right Jesus, I'm afraid. So um, Christ is very clear about that. Let me give you an example from my personal life. Some of you know I used to play drums way back when in San Diego. In my early 20s, I was in a band. It was a secular band. And it didn't take very long. I was, I was an immature believer back then. It was growing, still maturing my faith. Still am in, in many ways, but it did not take very long for me to realize I cannot honor God with this lifestyle, what this will require of me, and then my faith. My conscience was killing me. 
Okay, I wasn't doing drugs or anything like that, but I knew that sooner or later I was going to have to face a dilemma. There's no way to honor God in the local pub scene. I didn't belong there, much less drumming to those lyrics. They did not stood for, they did not represent what I stood for. So I, I had a dilemma in my hands. So I prayed for, for courage, and I came to my bandmates and said, guys, I'm, I'm quitting. They were shocked initially. They were, why? They were surprised. They knew I was a believer. And I told them, I, I can't do this. This is, I, um, my heart is somewhere else. I, I need to, I want to honor God in everything I do, and this is a hurdle for me. <laughs> and one of them said this, oh, Okay, so this is a phase you're going through. So you're having a midlife crisis at 22. I get it. So you'll grow out of it, and you will be back, I'm sure. And I said, I don't think so. And it wasn't easy, church. I, I'll tell you, I had to pray for courage to not look back on my decision, but I tell you right now, it was the best decision I've ever made because it wasn't until after that, maybe a week or two later, that I picked up my Bible and I realized, boy, I, I really want to keep reading. I really have the desire to know this, and it, God gave me an insatiable hunger for His Word, something I didn't have before. And I realized that God was giving me the gift of teaching, or maybe I already had it, I just didn't realize it until that point. And what that event in my life uh, did to me is because I prayed for Him, go, Lord, use me for Your glory. I want to be used of You. And what, event, what that event did in my life was it used to solidify my faith and for me to realize where my faith was rooted. It was rooted in the right stuff. It, it was rooted in the Word of God. And that served that one trial. It, it's a very minor, let's call it a dilemma. It wasn't even a trial. But that event in my life, God used that to prepare me for greater trials to come. And every time we faced a trial, or, or in, in our case, our family cases, two very hurtful tragedies, I, we were rooted in the Word of God. And God took us deeper and deeper every time. Every time. And to the point that there's no bitterness of what God has done in our life. There's actually a thankfulness, a gratitude that God got us closer to Him. We experienced the comfort of God, the sustaining grace of God in a level that we would not have experienced otherwise because of the tests of affliction, and not persecution in our case, but a very bad affliction twice. Something else I want you to notice here, the word immediately. Verses 5 Verse 5 says, immediately the seed uh, went up, you know, it sprang up. But he uses the same word in verse 21, immediately the false believer falls away. And we get the, the point here, right? The, same, uh, the, the, the uh, counterfeit faith of a false convert becomes evident as quickly as it becomes apparent. It only lasts until the first trial. And unfortunately, church, I've been doing this long enough where I have seen people crash in their uh, uh, counterfeit faith. I have seen shallow uh, believers realize that they didn't have the right stuff because it didn't, it didn't last until the first trial. I've told you this example of already of a very good friend that I led to Christ and we were studying the Bible every day to the point where one time we were walking down the street and somebody said, man, I haven't seen you, have you, I haven't seen you in, in, in the bars anymore. What's, what's wrong with you? And he gave him the gospel months later. I visited that same friend in jail because the gospel, it wasn't the real thing. And he even admitted it. Now, how do we interact with uh, superficial responses, the shallow faith or non-existing faith in that case? We pray for their salvation. We reason with them, yes, as, uh, unless they tell us to stop. I told you about a family member that I have that kept telling me, if you talk to me one more time about Jesus Christ, I'm going to stop coming to your home. And I promised him I wouldn't do it. But I said, do me a favor, don't die. Because you're going to hell if you do. <laughs> and so how do we deal with that? We reason with them, we pray for them. But we do not give them opportunities to spread a false message. We don't give them a platform. And sadly, some of these folks become church leaders. And they spread the false seeds of the false gospel. The gospel of, uh, of prosperity. That Jesus Christ was your boyfriend. That Jesus Christ was your therapist, but not the savior of the world. That Jesus Christ who says, come and sit on my lap and everything will be okay. But not the real God of the Bible who's coming back and who's going to judge sin. So... People respond in temporary selection. They don't like the, the more confrontational parts of the gospel, so they reject that. They seem to think that they can select the more comfortable parts of the message, and that's, you can't do that. 
So, and, and that leads us to the third response of the gospel here. When, when people hear the message, they are exposed to the message of the gospel. Not only some of them respond in total rejection, others in uh, temporary selection, and yet others in tragic deception. And that's what chapter uh, uh, verse 22 says, tragic deception. People are deceived into thinking they have the right stuff, very similar to the, the other, the previous type of soil here. Um, their identif- these folks here that he's describing in the third type of soil, their identification with Christ is only nominal, maybe temporary, and it lasts until the, the, the first faith testing, too, just like the other one. The only difference here is that in the previous category, the test was affliction and persecution. Notice with me here, church, that the second one here, or the third category of soil, the test is affluence and preoccupation. See, the first one is um, affliction and persecution. This one is affluence and preoccupation, usually because one leads to the, to, to the other. What do I mean by that? Usually, the wealthier you are, the more tempted uh, to be worried about losing your wealth you will be. Conversely, the less money you have, usually or generally, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms, the more tempted you will be to not trust Christ for your uh, needs. And I say generally because there's nothing wrong with being rich. And no, no, there's nothing wrong with being poor. The problem is not having money. The problem is when money has you. And that is the problem. When money has a grip on your heart, that's the reason why Jesus Christ talk, uh, talks about this over and over in the Gospels, about the traps of trusting money, the root of which is the, is the, um, uh, the love of which is the root of all evil, he says. But how does that work here in our day and age? We know that very clearly because that's our work. We live in this. Uh, but the, the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth is what Jesus Christ is talking about here. Again, there's no premium on being poor. That's not what he's talking about. I know people who are extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy, and they give and they are generous, and God blesses them even more. And I know, and, and, and also I know people who are extremely poor that don't make enough money and that they never have enough because they live, let's say they make 50000 a year, they live with fifty-five. And I know people who make a million dollars a year and they live with 900000 or even less than that. See, that's what uh, we're talking about here, the, the deceitfulness of wealth. How this is translated in our, in our society is this. If you live in the U.S., you are part of the wealthiest country in the world. Did you know that? Well, maybe China is trailing behind. But here in the U.S., we are the wealthiest nation in the world, and yet we are one of the neediest mission fields in the world. Let me tell you why. Four of the biggest companies in the world are headquartered here. Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple. One of them will be soon the first trillion-dollar company in the history of mankind. Um, and the reason why we are we're so uh, needed mission field here is because because of the growth and the wealth that we have, we have an insatiable appetite for consumption. That, that's how our economy it moves. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. Again, there's wrong if that is your God, if that is a matter of idolatry in your heart. We have a hunger for more stuff, always. Now, that is the reason, folks, why you would see people camping out in front of a store three days before a smartphone is launched that costs $1,000 when the same phone costs $99 in the mall down the street and it does the exact same things. And it's the same reason you'll see people buying a pair of shoes for $700 when a more comfortable shoes but maybe less glamorous costs $30. It's because of our desire to appear successful, our desire to appear attractive, and those products will, in our minds, make us more attractive. That's the deceitfulness of wealth that Jesus Christ is talking about here, and that's how it's translated in our world. We have a desire to be loved. And in our minds, see how that, how that is twisted? In our minds, we think that if we own these things, we will be perceived as successful, therefore we'll be more attractive. Why? Because we want to be loved. But church, have you considered that God took care of that need for you and me? You need to look no further than the Bible to conclude that you are loved unconditionally by a God who so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for you, even if you were only the, the only one person in the world. And to whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. Now, you don't need more stuff. You don't need more money. What you need is Jesus Christ. If you don't have him, he will transform your heart and give you a healthy and biblical self-perception. That's what we need. Don't you think for a moment, church, that the United States is not a mission field. 
We need as much, as many people sowing the seeds of the true gospel here in the West as we have, for example, in Africa and Latin America and other, other parts of the world. They, they have different issues, but they equally need the gospel. They equally need this, the good seed of the true gospel. And it's our job to make sure that it, the gospel gets to them. Did you know that? Unbelievers are not going to pay to be reached, church. It's our job to send them to the mission field. The mission field may be across the street. It may be across the ocean. But the reason why we are deceived by, uh, by wealth, it's because uh, the messages that we see on TV and, 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 and in magazine ads, that they cater to that desire. You will be perceived as more successful, therefore more attractive, therefore more lovable if you buy the phone you can't really afford. If you get the car that is three times your annual salary. Or if... Um, you get the gadget you don't even know how to operate so the reason many people reject Christ because in their minds identification with Jesus Christ threatens their perception of success of swag and sophistication case in point case in point the Pharisees the Sadducees and the scribes they rejected Christ they said we are the religious uh, elite of this town here we don't need you <laughs> Talking about a king? This guy is a friend of sinners. This guy eats with tax collectors. Kings are born in palaces. Do you know who that guy is? He was born in a manger. He's the son of a carpenter. He cannot be the king of kings. And therefore, their minds were blinded by Satan. Their hearts were closed to the gospel. And if that unbelief persisted, they would end up in hell. Thankfully, there are some Pauls here that we can look at. And there's some other examples of guys at that level who, become, who became true believers in Christ. Friend, likewise, you stand condemned in the eyes of God unless you come to Jesus Christ, unless you embrace the true gospel. There's another agricultural illustration that Jesus used, for example, in John 15, 6. He says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. Uh, and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned meaning they are going to hell. You're going to be spending eternity away from your Creator. That's the message here. Unless you abide in Christ, unless you come to Jesus Christ in faith, you will respond to, to Him according to the next uh, category of soil here. So, but before we get to that, let's, how should we interact with people who are strangled by worry of, uh, of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth? We reason with them. We say, don't be choked out. Don't let the riches get in the way. Don't be deceived. And please be reconciled with God today. Uh, and be admitted into the, the kingdom of God where real riches await you. But unless you come to Jesus Christ, there is no way. I'm not the one who said this. Jesus Christ was the first one who said it. We're just echoing his words. That we're, we're just imitating the, the first uh, sower of the seed after the precursor, the forerunner. So people will respond to the gospel in total rejection and temporary selection and in tragic deception. But fourthly and thankfully, some people will respond to the gospel positively and that will result in true salvation. That's what verse 23 tells us. And Jesus now compares this group of people with the good soil. But we need to understand something here very quickly. He is not saying that the gospel is reserved for people who are already good by nature. Hear me carefully here. That's not what he's saying. Otherwise, none of us will make it to heaven. We will all be doomed. Because the Bible says very clearly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not what he's saying here, that people are uh, inherently good. There is no not one, the Bible says, that is inherently good. You may be a very good citizen. You may be a very good person, but you are still a sinner in the eyes of God. Unless you come to faith in Christ, you will be a redeemed sinner if you do, and therefore a saved sinner. But if not, you will be a condemned sinner. And that's tragic. But now he says some people, uh, the, he is illustrating the response of some people with the good soil here. And a good soil means a receptive heart. A heart that's been plowed by the Holy Spirit. A heart that's been tilled. A ground that's been prepared to receive uh, the message. He clarifies the job of the Holy Spirit here, Jesus does, in John 16, 8. He says he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness in judgment. Now, I heard this from a, a fellow preacher, uh, James Montgomery Boy. Some of you may have heard of him, a late uh, pastor of 10th Presby Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. He says this, the Holy Spirit is the divine gardener. 
And I like that. The divine gardener. Unless you have the divine gardener working in your heart, the seed cannot penetrate um, your heart. The seed cannot penetrate the soil. Now, in speaking of penetrating the soil, did you notice that true salvation, genuine salvation, always produces fruit? Some more visible than others. Some take more time than others, but there's always going to be fruit. Think of the thief on the cross. The guy didn't have any time to do anything for the kingdom, did he? And yet, we talk about him today. That's good fruit. That's maybe a hundredfold fruit. I don't know. But genuine believer will always produce fruit. Maybe not as visible. Maybe depending on how you pursue sanctification. Depending on how you, you, you get after it. But did you notice the uh, similarities here with Psalm 1? When, uh, when, when the psalmist writes, Blesses the man who walks not according to the counsel of the wicked, nor stands at the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. So there is a season for fruit. It's not right away. It may take some time for some people. So let's not rule out somebody who has received Christ a week ago and say, How come he's not preaching the word? Well, it, it takes time. People are afraid. Don't you think I'm afraid of going out and, and preaching Christ uh, to, to, to others? I've, I've told you, pray for me. I hate to do that in planes. I'm going on a plane next week, so pray for me. I told you this. Let's, uh, the story, for those of you who don't know, I, I, I'm a bad soul winner in planes. Okay? I don't like to do it. I don't know why I put sermons. I listen to other people's sermons on, on my earphones here, and I, I reason with God. I'm being spiritual. So I don't want to share Christ with the person next to me, even though sometimes they start the conversation. So I am glad to tell you that last September, when we flew back from Brazil, my family and I, I shared Christ with the person next to me for nine hours. And that person was my wife. It was, a <laughs> it was in practice mode until she said, I want to go back to sleep. I'm practicing my sermon. So... Pray for me. We're going to be on a plane uh, next week. It's only a three-hour flight. Um, thankfully, we, 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 all, the, all three of us will be sitting together. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, you have a, a, a captive audience for three, four, five hours. Why not take advantage of that? Anyway, um, maybe I need more fruit in that area. <laughs> but there is a crop. When, when, a genuine, uh, when genuine salvation takes place, there is a crop. Um, Compare that crop in verse 8 to the sprout of verse 5. And the lesson is this. Genuine salvation not only produces fruit, but the genuine believer always perseveres, even though he may fall from time to time. Because the fruit is always there. He's not withered away. There's a season of fruit. Now, uh, we endure. The genuine believer will endure affliction and persecution even though, again, he may respond and he may refuse to share the gospel with someone on the plane, even though he may respond in bitterness uh, during a time of trial, even though he may struggle with some things, habits, or maybe addictions, the true believer, the genuine believer, will always endure because his faith is rooted in the Word of God. Now, and it's not because of his ability to persevere. If that were the case, none of us would persevere. What, 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 the Word of God teaches us here is that a genuine believer will persevere because of the sustaining grace of God. The power is, in, is with Him. He enables us to go through our challenges and our trials. He equips us to press on. Why? Because we run for the Word of God whenever we, we are struggling with, with, with uh, tragic events, with trials, or we, we know where to go. We know where to go get filled up. We know where we're going to find words that are going to cause us to grow. And we know where to find our self-esteem, for example. We were talking about this a few moments ago. Friends, I never read the Bible more. I got to tell you this. I never read the Bible more than when I was waiting for my son to be released from the hospital to be told that he didn't make the surgery. And that will do it to you. A tragedy for a genuine believer. It will keep you on your knees, even though initially you may be bitter. But ultimately, you will always run towards the throne of God because you know like the disciples here, where are we going to go? You are the one who has words of life. And that's the reason Paul told Timothy, suffer hardship with me like a soldier of Christ. 
because the young pastor was facing difficulties, discouragement during the time Paul wrote to him. He says, suffer hardship with me. Friends, hardship is part of the Christian life. You, there, there's no way we can avoid it. I wish there were, but there is, there's no way. So consider this for you. If you are going through a hard time, if you're going through affliction, consider that this is a time of a season of fruit. For you. How about that? It may be a season for fruit bearing for you. Fruit does not grow in the, in the mountain, I'm told. It grows in the valley or the other way around. I can't, can't even remember my own illustration. But brothers and sisters, <laughs> consider your present affliction, a season of fruit bearing, an opportunity for Christ to be glorified in you more significantly than in normal times. Um, and this is the last lesson of this parable here. According to Jesus, statistically, one in four people will own, respond positively to the message of the gospel. Everybody else may reject him. Uh, and knowing this will keep us from producing responses, for fabricating, from manipulating people into an emotional response, only to, to find later on that this was not the real deal. So uh, this will keep pastors from being discouraged. This will keep workers from being run out of churches or burned out because we know what to expect. We should expect rejection. And people will reject not only the message, they will reject you. They will shun you if you keep talking about Jesus Christ to them. It's the cost of discipleship. It's how we identify with our master. The, the, the Bible says, what Jesus says is, the servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you as well. Every time you, are, you decide in your heart to, worship, to, to, to um, preach Christ, people will reject the message and they will reject you as well. So we need to be prepared for that. How do we deal with that? We encourage one another. If there's only one of us here doing the sowing, that one person is going to be burned out very quickly. Very quickly. And that is the reason, friend, if you come to this church, I am here by recruiting you to be a sower. Now, you don't have to do it like I do. I, I do that every week from the, from the pulpit here. I get to do it on an individual basis as well. You don't have to do it exactly how I do it, but you do need to be sowing the gospel. Otherwise, you are not serving God at full potential. You may be majoring in the minors if you are not preaching Christ. Consider this, and don't tell me that you preach Christ by your lifestyle because you may be deceiving people into thinking you're good enough. That well, if, if I'm just good like, the, like he is, like she is, then I don't need Jesus Christ. And the other thing, too, is when, when, you, when the friendship is strong enough for you to tell them about Christ, you may be tempted to not tell them about Christ because you don't want to risk losing the friendship. You need to be speaking. You need to be a witness. You need to be telling others about Jesus Christ. We are in the agriculture business as well, spiritually speaking. We sow seeds. And here is the good news. We cannot fail if we are sowing. Our job is to sow. Failure to sow is the ultimate failure. It means we're being unfaithful and sowing the wrong seed or de deceiving people into thinking uh, that, you know, giving them a wrong message is the ultimate act of high treason. So church, join me. We encourage one another. If, if two or three of us are tired, it's time to take a little five-minute breather. We'll do that knowing that other people are sowing. Then we get back in the field. So if that's you, my friend, if, if you have, and mo most of you here have embraced Jesus Christ and you've responded in, in faith and therefore you are genuinely saved, you are a true believer of Christ, he expects you to be sowing the seeds. And, and if you're part of a local church, it's your job to be trained to sow seeds. It's not my job to do the, so, the, the, the seed sowing by myself. I, I can only last so long. It's my job to equip you to do it. So Come and join me in Seed Sowing 101. I'm going to train you to do it. And you don't have to do it like me. I mean, you don't have the same personality. I speak two languages. I can do it in two languages. Some of you speak three languages, four. You can do it. And you just do it one, one at a time so as not to confuse people. <laughs> but just serve God at full potential. What a great resolution. Huh? How about that? Think about that. In the year coming up, uh, tell God that you want to be uh, so uh, you want to be a sower of the gospel. You want to be trained. You want to sign up and, and to be trained to be um, a soul winner because that's what he expects you to do. Now, in how do we respond um, to the challenge before of us here? We, 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 we tell God, God, prepare me. Use me for your honor and for your glory. Now, although we may be shocked um, by people's rejection, sometimes we feel uh, we are hurt by people's rejection. How can anyone 
pass up such a compassionate offer. Jesus will take your guilt and he'll give you eternal life. I mean, you'd have to be a fool to reject that, right? And we, we, are, we get heartbroken when people reject the message. But here's what I, what I um, learned to do in, throughout the years. Instead of being heartbroken by the people who reject Christ, I decide to focus on the people who do accept Christ. I decide to focus on those folks and then equip them for, for fruit bearing so that they can bear fruit, so that they can join me in the harvest here. And, and, and join me in prayer for the ones who reject Christ. So I rejoice with that. Why do I do that? Because the Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven when a sinner comes to Jesus Christ. I just want to join the party. So I am very, very encouraged that even though the more we preach, the more we sow the seeds, more people will reject, there will be some people who will accept Christ, who will embrace Jesus Christ, and they will therefore have genuine faith. They will respond in total salvation. And obviously, we can't conclude today's message without asking, what kind of soil are you? Jesus is comparing the soils here with people's heart, people's conditions uh, in their hearts. What is the condition of your heart today? Now, I know some of you, I don't know some of you. I don't know where you are. I can tell uh, the, those of you who I know very well, you are very genuine believers. There's obvious fruit in your life. There's a desire to honor Him, a desire to serve Him. But how about those, uh, if your heart is hardened today, the seed is bouncing right back. Um, can you consider the fact that you're listening to this message, the Holy Spirit is plowing the heart, is plowing your heart, He is tilling the ground in your heart? If you are dealing with a crisis right now, consider the fact that that's part of your growth. That's part of your growth. It's an opportunity for you to verify that your faith is rooted in the right things, namely the Word of God. And... Um, and if you are a genuine believer, I do expect you to join me in the harvest. I do expect you to join me in, in sowing the seeds. Again, I, I only have two arms. But if you join me and grab your bag of seeds and serve here, and like we've already verified that the U.S., Salem, and our community here is a mission field because there's a, lot, a bunch of nominal Christians, people who think that they're believers just because they're Americans. Uh, you, you'd be surprised how, how many times I hear that. Well, I, I grew up in the U.S. I, I'm a Christian. <laughs> Has there been a rebirth in your life? Well, what's that? That's a mission field. That's an opportunity to lead them to Christ. Well, I've been going to a church all my life. Oh, great. I live in my garage my whole life. Doesn't make me a car. So that's a silly illustration. But that's it's an opportunity to give them the gospel. So join me in doing that. I promise it will be the last time I give that illustration because you've heard this already three times. I'll come up with new ones for 2019. But in the meantime, join me in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to sow seeds, the opportunity to work in your field, Lord, and to be sowers and to be broadcasting the message of salvation. And what a great message, Lord, that there is no salvation in anyone else apart from Jesus Christ, Lord. And it's our great joy to introduce him to the world. It's our great joy to talk about him. We naturally talk about the people who are important to us, so we want to talk about Jesus Christ because he is the most important person to us. He's our most treasured possession, Father. And uh, I pray that this will always be the case with us, Lord. Some of us, sometimes we grow weary. Sometimes we get tired. Lord, I pray that we, that's the purpose of the, the, the body of Christ, Lord. That we, I pray that we will be able to come alongside those who are um, taking a break or whatever, Lord. And we will uh, encourage them to get back in the field, Lord. But... Um, we can't do that apart from the equipping of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that this morning, um, people who are listening to this will be encouraged to get back in the field and to sow seeds, Lord, because people will respond in, in, in positively. They will respond in faith, even though most people may reject the message. Some people will accept, and they will embrace Jesus Christ, Lord, and we rejoice over that. Lord, and I want to pray that if any of my brothers and sisters here are feeling the pressure of affliction, Lord, and that's keeping them from, from doing what they're supposed to do, which we concluded today was sow the seed. Lord, I pray that you give them an extra measure of your grace, of your sustaining grace. Lord, remind them that you have loved them with an everlasting love and you want them to grow and you want to use them, Lord, for your honor, for your glory, Father, and that 
Um, they will consider this as, as a season for fruit bearing, Lord. And I pray that this will always be the case for us here, Father. We will always be producing fruit for your honor and for your glory, oh Lord. And I pray that nothing will ever hinder us from preaching the word of God, from preaching Christ. Lord, if it ever starts to happen here, Lord, I pray that you will drive us right back in the right path, Father, and um, that, that you will close these doors if ever we stop preaching the gospel, the true gospel here. If we ever close your Bible here, Lord, we might as well close the door. And I pray that this will be the case, Lord. But in the meantime, Lord, I pray that you will uh, equip us and give us uh, an extra dose of enthusiasm to preach your word, Lord, knowing that many people will reject. But Father, give us um, the courage and the stamina and to keep going, to keep sowing, Lord, because that's when uh, you get honored and glorified, Lord. And I pray that um, now uh, at the Christmas season, um, Lord, and as we celebrate the birth of our Christ tomorrow and then on the 25th, Lord, again, we will meditate on what that means to us and we will be compassionate for people who don't know Jesus Christ enough so that we will tell them about Christ, whether it's in a plane or on the phone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.